Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Jackie. I'm an alcoholic. Happy Sober Saturday, everybody. It's a great day to be sober. In fact, every day is a good day to be sober. And I'm so glad to get, I'm so honored to be here and that Mark asked me to share at this meeting and to uh, be a part of my recovery. And it's so good to see all you people out there. It's just, uh, I love my life. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, about five, six years ago, I went to a meeting and it was a chip meeting and a they were giving out uh, chips for their birthday, and there was a young girl who had two years, and when they announced her name, she came running up the aisle, I mean, just running up that aisle, and she gets up there, and she goes, man, I am so jazzed, and you know, that's how I feel. I am so jazzed to be here and so jazzed about my life, and uh, you know, I what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today is, uh, it's a miracle. I will tell you, it's a miracle. I, I, um... I like to tell this story only because it's kind of a, a capsule of about 24, 34 years of my life. I was born in Memphis, but I was raised in Cleveland. And uh, my stepfather, who my, when my father went to the store for cigarettes and never came home, so my mother remarried, and uh, she married a very abusive uh, alcoholic. Anyway, he was a, he was a bartender, and my mother was a night clerk at a hotel. And so the three of us, my my sister and brother and I, would be at home alone all night. And uh, every night in Cleveland, the ice cream man would come. It would be the good humor man would come around, and I would get very jealous because all the kids in the neighborhood would have money, and they would all get ice cream, and we never we never could. And I remember to think, I was probably about 10 years old, and uh, I remember thinking I could hear the bell, ting, ting, tinking, coming down the street, and I thought, you know what? I want ice cream tonight. This, tonight, I'm getting ice cream. And I thought, where am I going to get money? So I go running around the house, and I'm looking in the cushions, and I'm looking in pockets, and I remembered my father was a, my stepfather was a bartender, and he had a little cup of coins that he had that people would leave him, and he had it in his dresser drawer. The only problem with that is he would put tape on the door. And if you broke that tape to go into their bedroom, you would get beat. And I remember hearing that bell, and it kept coming closer and closer, and I could think, should I do it? Should I do it? Should I do it? I said, oh, I don't care. I'm doing it. So I broke open that door and broke the tape, got that dime, and I'm running down the stairs, and the ice cream truck's getting further and further away. I'm hearing it go, tinkle, 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 tinkle. I'm going, wait for me. Wait, wait for me. I want some ice cream. And so I finally get up there, and I'm out of breath, and I go, I want a Mr. Good Bar. Give him my dime, and he gives me the Mr. Good Bar. I take the wrapper off a bird flies over and poops on it. And that's the story of the next 34 years of my life. Uh, true story, you know. What I realized was I was always running towards something. I never worried about the consequences. And when I got there, it wasn't what I thought after all, you know. And that, that bird that flew over happened to be a bottle of vodka for many years. That was the dark cloud that was following me. But like I said, uh, I don't talk too much about my childhood, but there's some really important facts that were instrumental in forming who I was um, and, and how I behaved until I made it into Alcoholics Anonymous. And again, my father, my, my real father went to the store for cigarettes and never came home. So my mother, my mother had, we had moved from Memphis. We were living in the projects. My mother was uneducated, did not have a job at the time. She had three children. And so, you know, she did what the only thing she knew how to survive. And so she married my stepfather, who, again, was very abusive, mentally and physically abusive. And I hated him. I hated everything about him. I always say I hated him from my toes to my head. And the thing about it was I was so afraid. I don't ever remember not being afraid as a child. I was afraid to talk. I was afraid to be alone. I was afraid I wasn't going to be loved. It was just this overpowering fear. And I hated my mother. I hated my mother because she stayed married to him for 15 years. And so that was the relationship that I built most of my relationships on for the next few years until I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, based on the resentment of my stepfather and my mother. The other thing I'd like to mention as a child is even though I was from an abusive home, even though I was afraid all the time, 
two things were prominent in my life and uh, opposite of my mother. I was born an optimist. I really was. There was something in me, and now I know, you know, in the book it talks about within every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God deep within them. Never went to church, was never taught about God. Uh, I don't even know if I, if I ever said the word God, but I always knew there was something out there. I always, it was, it was inside of me. And I would always say, I know it's going to get better. I know it's going to get better. And my mother was a depressive. And again, she was uneducated. She felt she was trapped. She didn't drink. You know, she was very much abused. She saw us abused and had no way to get out, or she thought. There was no way to get out. And she'd always say, the world is going to beat you down. You're going to see that it's not fair. You're going to see that men are going to use you. And, you know, I go, no, I just, I just know it's going to be okay. I just know it's going to be okay. And I did that for many years. You know, I grew up in the era of, uh, of uh, the power of positive thinking with uh, Norman Vincent Peale and, and I'm okay, you're okay, and all these these. And they were great. They were great books. I mean, they helped me in my jobs over the years, but I found out later on that they never helped with the disease of alcoholism. And so it was such a, it was such a strange thing. You know, when I was 10 years old, everything happened when I was 10, somewhere around there. Uh, I saw a movie called The Three Faces of Eve. And for you, older people. You know what that is. It's a true story of a woman who had multiple personalities. And one was this uh, housewife and goody two-shoes did everything right. One was a um, wild, wild lady, I guess I'll say. And the other one was this scared little girl. And at a very young age, I knew I was her. I mean, I was very young when I saw that movie, and yet I knew. Actually, when I grew up, I thought it was more like Sybil. But when I was little, I was only I was only Eve, and I became Sybil. But um, you know, so there was this there was this torn personality in me. This this thing that I'm going to make it. It's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And then there was the other side of of the 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 dynamic that was saying, No, you're not going to make it. It's not going to be good. I went to high school. Um, I was a good student. I loved, I loved getting out of the house, so I loved classes. I loved learning. I had this insatiable need to learn, to find out why. That was another thing I would do. You know, this fundamental idea of God deep within us. As a little girl, when I, when all the violence was going on and I was so afraid, I would go outside and I would sit for hours and talk to, I, I don't even know who I was talking to. I didn't have to name it. I didn't have to describe it. But when I was out there, this incredible peace would come over me. And I think maybe that's where I got the positive thing that somewhere a voice was telling me, that inner voice was telling me, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So I went to high school. I didn't take drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't hang around with anybody that took drugs or, or drink. My, my goal was to be perfect. I had to be perfect. I was the middle child, and I just I just knew that if I wasn't perfect, I wasn't okay. I joined every club there was to join. I got on a treadmill at 12 years old, and I ran. I ran at high speed until I got into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. There was a movie called, uh, I think it was in the 80s, it was called I'm Running As Fast As I Can. And that was me. It was, like again, I was running. I don't know what I was running to, um, and I'm not sure what I was running from, but I was always running. And so, you know, my only goal in, uh, in life was to get out of that house. And in those days, you know, you get married, you know, we didn't talk about college. We didn't have any money to go to college. I wasn't going to go to school or anything. We worked and that's what we did. We worked, but I couldn't wait to get out of the house. And so, uh, at 19 years old, I got fixed up with a man through my, through my sister. And I talk a lot about the fact that in our lives, there are certain occurrences that happen, and in a split second, you will never be the same. Nothing about you will ever be the same in just a split second. And that happened to me when I was 19 years old. I went out with this man. My first date was we went to a bar to see his belly dan his ex-belly dancer girlfriend dance. <laughs> Should have known then. And, uh, uh, yeah, we, he, he was very nice, and I, uh, something magical happened, something that was going to change me for many, many years. I walked into that bar, and the smoke and the lights and the laughter and the music, I was hooked. It was like, it was like a wonderful world of color, you know, the Disney, Disney show on Sunday nights, you know, when you wish upon a star. You know, it was like I walked in, and I go, oh, my gosh, I love this. This is wonderful. But what changed me was that first drink of alcohol. 
I loved it. I loved everything about it. It changed me in an instant. Any, anything I might have been, could have been, should have been, was changed instantly. That person that Jackie was supposed to be was changed in that moment because I loved it. I loved everything about it. You know, my friends would say, oh, I hate the taste of alcohol. And I go, really? I love the taste of alcohol. I loved how it burned my lips. I loved how it burned my tongue and burned my throat and would go down inside me and I would get all warm and I, and in my stomach, I would love it. And, and I could be somebody else. I could be living somewhere else. I would, I was in that pretend world and I would dance and sing and I would be the life of the party and, and, and I loved it. And it became my home. Those bars became my home for many years. And that booze was the cure for everything. I loved it. I loved vodka. It was, it was, it was just something so special to me. So I ended up marrying that man. I was 20 years old and I married him because he had a family. And I thought, that's what I need. If I only have a family, I'll be okay. He had a mother and a father, and they had Sunday dinners. And that was going to make me okay, because we didn't have that. We had violence. We had abuse. We had so much uh, anger in our house that I just always had to run from. And so I married this man. Didn't love him. Didn't love him. I was marrying him for his family. Well, after a few of those Sunday dinners, I thought, oh, my gosh, what have I done? They were all alcoholics full-blown alcoholics, the mother, the father, and him. They were all alcoholics. And they sat around on Sunday, and they talked about the world and how they hated everybody. They hated Catholics. They hated Jews. They hated blacks. They hated Mexicans. I'd sit there going, oh, my gosh, this is horrible. But the one thing I loved about that family, they drank all day long. I could drink. And I knew I had made a mistake. I knew it. And what I did was I started living in the bars. You know, I was 20 years old, and and uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to go where I feel good. You know, I'm going to go where I can dance and sing and be somebody else. Now, he would go to his bars. He was a full-blown alcoholic, and I would go to my bars, and we started doing things that people in bars do, even though I was married. And the one thing I had was, remember, that fundamental idea of God deep within me. And I call it now my conscience. And I knew I was doing wrong. I knew that I wasn't supposed to be that person. And yet something about alcohol, it was like I had a switch in my head. It was like it turned it from I care to I don't care. I don't care. And it's okay because it's only for tonight and I can be, wake up tomorrow and it's going to be okay. And so, you know, I w- would wake up every morning and go, why did I do that? What am I doing? I started seeing my first psychiatrist at 19 years old. And uh, I, I, we would talk about my family and they would say, yeah, you, you have childhood issues and all that stuff. They, they, they verified to me, they, they, um, they gave me permission, at least I thought. They gave me permission to drink and live the life I was living. And so uh, that went on for about three years, and we started hating each other, and I thought, i got to do something. I, I, I can't do this. I, I would reach that level of, I can't do this anymore. And what do I do? I have a baby. If I have a baby, that's going to make me okay. I know that's going to make me okay. And I always say it was like yesterday. I remember holding my son in my arms. I remember, I do remember it like it was yesterday. I held him in my arms and I said, you will never come from a home like I came from. I vow to you, I am going to be a good mother. You will come from a home of love and caring. And I meant it. I meant every word. I wasn't lying. I meant every word of that. The problem is, is I was already full-blown alcoholic at that time. And since he was in the bar, I had gotten this attitude of, you know, oh, no, you're not going to go out there and do that. I'm going to go, too. And I started getting babysitters on the weekend. And then I would get them on Thursdays. And then I would get them on Wednesdays. And, uh, you know, I was doing that cycle. I go, my God, what's wrong with me? And I started going to more psychiatrists, begging them, literally begging them to tell me what was wrong with me. And they would tell me, well, it's your family, and it's your stepfather, and it's the abuse. And it's, all, oh, yeah, that's right. In fact, many years later, I was sitting at a bar with a friend of mine, another alcoholic, and uh, we were drinking, and I said, do you think I drink too much? And he goes, no, your life sucks. I go, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> right, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so we had been married five years, and I thought, this just isn't going to work. I know, I'll have two kids. Two kids will make it better. I know I will be a good mother. I know I will do better. If I have two kids, I will stay home. Well, you know what happened. The same thing happened. I had my daughter, and I vowed the same vow. 
and yet I couldn't follow through with it. And I don't know why I couldn't follow through with it. It was so perplexing to me because I was an avid power of positive thinking, and it's going to be okay. And I still have that attitude. It's going to be okay. I just know it's going to be okay, and my life's going to turn around here. I just know it. I ended up divorcing that man, and uh, there's a, a lot of things that I, when I was a, when I was a kid, I hated being alone. I mean, not hated being alone. I was definitely afraid to be alone. Definitely afraid of not being loved. And so what I did was I was living in the bars. I was getting babysitters. Uh, in fact, a couple times their mother had to come and take over because they had to go to school. And I would get home and I'd go, why am I doing this stuff? I don't understand it. You know, and I started something that was so detrimental to my soul. And that was... I started to believe the lie. You know, a little bit of creeping in would be, what if my mother's right? What if there is no hope? What if there is no God? And, and I would push that away. No, there is. There is. It is. My kids ended up going to live with their father because I couldn't stay sober. I had great jobs. Always had a great job. That power of positive thinking really works well with jobs, by the way. And, uh, and so I always had a good job. And I could put on this mask. I could dress up and look good and go to my job. And yet my soul seemed to be getting darker and darker and darker. I started playing softball for a, a women's league at a VFW. And uh, it was fun. Played on Sundays. We had double headers. We'd go drinking. My kids would come over for the weekend. And I would sit in that bar all day long. And they were just like it. All the other people were doing the same thing. You know, they're playing on the floor and we're drinking away. And uh, in walks Joe. Now, Joe, it was 1975, 76. It was the time of Miami Vice. And uh, Joe walked in with his white suit and his chains and you know, kind of had that walk, you know, and I went, oh my gosh, I don't need a family. I need him. <laughs> you know, he just made my heart just pitter patter. If I have him, I know my life will be better. You know, it's chasing that Mr. Goodbar. It's chasing that ice cream. It's always something out there that's going to help this in here. And, uh, and so I, I married Joe. Joe was, uh, good looking. I thought I was going to have an ace. The problem was, was he was my stepfather all over again. He made my first husband look like Sir Lancelot. And I went, my God, what have I done? He was doing to my children what my stepfather had done to me. And I went, my God, what's wrong with me? Why do I do these things? Now, I will tell you, I have read thousands of books. I have read, I've read the Bible. I've searched for religions. And I swear to you, I had no idea alcohol was my problem. I had no idea. I was drinking every day. I had no idea. I, now, now, both of them were alcoholics. I could go to my friends and say, my husband's an alcoholic, and they'd go, yeah. And I drink because he's an alcoholic. See, I have to live through it, so I have to drink because he's an alcoholic. And they would buy into it. And I started seeing more psychiatrists. I mean, it was this vicious circle. I only stayed married to that man for two years. I was lost. My kids, the guilt was so overpowering to me that my kids were living with their father and I'm working and I'm drinking and I'm going to bars and I'm thinking, you know, there's got to be a better way. And so I started running again. So I worked at a bank during the day. I was a cocktail waitress at night and a bartender on weekends. I was working 88 hours a week and I did not know how to stop. I could not stop running. It was like if I stopped running, I would die. If I stopped running, then my head would take over, and I could not live with my thoughts. I could not live with what I was doing. I could not face it. I was going to churches. I was searching out. I'm going to psychiatrists, and I still had no idea alcohol was my problem. None. You know, and I always thought I was pretty intelligent. You know, so um, I'm, I'm working at this bar, and in walks Al. Al walks into my Saturday bartending job. Now, Al was a dancer, and, uh, and he could tell jokes. And I went, oh, family, I don't need a family. I don't need Miami Vice. I need him. Every woman knows you got to, if you have a dancer and a joke teller, it's going to be okay, right? It's going to be fine. And so I, start, I started dating Al, and we would go bar hopping. And, you know, we would walk in the bar, and they'd go, it's Jackie and Al. And I'd go, yeah, we're here, yeah, it's all fine. And I was dying inside. You know, my soul was getting darker and darker. And that touch with that higher power that I had, that God that I had as a little girl, started getting darker and darker. And it was harder for me to reach out and ask for help for that. 
And I, I got engaged to Al, and we went to all our, you know, I'd go to work during the day, you know, and go to my bartending jobs at night. And uh, he, got, he got hooked on cocaine. Now, I smoked a little wacky tobacco, uh, took some pills to go to sleep, because I couldn't go to sleep, uh, drank a lot of booze, you know. But I'm a little too good to date anybody that takes cocaine. I mean, come on. Uh, and so... Uh, so a year and a half into our engagement, uh, he came over one night, and he was drunk one day. Actually, it was Veterans Day. He, he walked in, and he was drunk. And I said, you know what, Al? It's, it's over. It's over. And he goes, what do you mean it's over? It's not over. And I go, yeah, it's over. I can't do this anymore. Again, right before it would get really bad, I would say, it's over. I cannot do this anymore. And he argued with me for a little while, and then all of a sudden, he kind of cocked his head, and he, he looked at me. And he said, it's over? And I go, yeah, it's over. And he got up, he walked into my kitchen, he opened a drawer, pulled out a knife, and stabbed himself to death. And his last words to me were, I effing hate you. And I thought, you know, at that moment you would think somebody who read as much as I read, somebody who searched for God as much as I was trying to search for God, would have an answer. That, that I would say, my God, where is drinking taking me? What's going on with my life? That's not what I said. I said, nobody hates me as much as I hate me. And I began to live my life really like a woman who hates herself. And, you know, when I, when I got sober, um, when I was 56, actually, I went and got my, my master's degree and, uh, in psychology. And um, they, I took a class on battered women. And there was a, a, a seminar on the syndrome called learned helplessness. And battered women, or men, uh, what happens is they get beat down so severely, be called stupid so much, they began to believe they're abusers. And so they have what's called learned helplessness. And people, you know, would say, why don't they leave? Because they can't. Because they believe the lie. But I believe I had something called learned hopelessness. And I remember going to a bar and looking in the mirror and for the first time going, my mother was right. There is no hope. This is who I'm supposed to be. I'm just no darn good. That's who I am. I'm just no darn good. And I gave up God, and I gave up hope. I still worked, uh, but I had I had dove into a darkness that I don't know how I I got out of. I was working at my Saturday another Saturday bar job, and in walks Dan, <laughs> and uh, yeah I know, and uh, in walks Dan, and uh, you know. I found out later that a lot of my addiction was men also. We, we go from one to another. Anything, anything to fill that hole inside of us. Anything, because we cannot bear that emptiness that we carry around with us. I couldn't, be, I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. So I had to keep busy. And so uh, I meet Dan, and he was living in Cleveland, although he really lived in Tucson, Tucson, Arizona. And uh, we started talking, we started dating, and he goes, well, I'm going back to Tucson. I go, oh. Oh, you're, you're leaving me? And he goes, well, why don't you marry me? Come to Tucson, Arizona. I went, that's what I need, sunshine. I was telling Mark, Cleveland is the second city in the United States with the least amount of sunshine. I go, that's why I drink. I'm from Cleveland. There's no sunshine. If I go to Tucson, where, the sad part about that is, I believe that. that. That is really what I believe. I believe if I go far enough away, if I, if, if I get in the sunshine, something will happen to me. I'll find my God again. It'll all be okay. I'll forget all these bad memories. I took my daughter with me. My son ended up staying in Cleveland, took my daughter with me with Dan, and uh, off we went to Tucson, Arizona. And for the first six months, it was fabulous. You know, but the problem is, is wherever you go, there you are. And, I, and I'm the same person. I haven't changed. And I don't know how to handle life. I know how to work. And I, I work very well. You know, I can make money. I can do that. I can reason a lot of things out. I do not know how. You know, in the book it talks about an alcoholic is absolutely incapable of forming a true partnership with another individual. That's me. I had no idea. I couldn't even do it with my children. I had no idea how to form a partnership with another human being. And I get down there, and because I'm blind and because I was drunk and, you know, all that, I'm six months into it, and all of a sudden he was a different man. He had a 13-year-old daughter. I had my daughter at the time. I think she was eight, eight or nine. Um, his daughter hated my daughter. My daughter hated his daughter. He hated my daughter. My daughter hated him. I hated his daughter, and I went, oh, my God, I've done it again. And I didn't know what to do. 
The only thing I knew what to do was drink. That's the only thing I knew what to do. Uh, he, he did not work very often out of the six years that we were married. He maybe worked two, two of those years. So I took up the slack and worked a couple jobs because remember, that's all I know how to do is run. He wasn't very kind to my daughter again. Uh, and I'm drinking, smoking a little wacky tobacco, and I'm dying inside, and I don't know what to do. I'm seeing psychiatrists. It's probably, uh, I don't know, by this time, my 20th psychiatry, 25th psychiatrist. I don't know. Begging them. I remember being at a party, and uh, and I was drunk, and I was telling my girlfriend, I was literally begging her, please help me, Lenore, please. And she goes, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do for you. I go, I don't know what to do either. And here I am. I'm in Tucson. Uh, my daughter doesn't like it. Everything's falling apart again. I'm just no darn good. That, that's the only thing I could come up with. I'm just no damn good. And my daughter ended up going back to, to Cleveland. I get a divorce from this man, and my biggest fear has occurred. I'm alone. I'm totally alone. I'm living in a basement apartment. I'm drinking a fifth of booze a night. I'm going to work. I'm getting dressed up. I went from fancy hotels because I worked for a bank. I went from the hors d'oeuvres to the fancy hotels, you know, smoking my cigarette, acting, you know, like a lady, well, somewhat of a lady, and uh, to the to the pub across the street, Al's pub across the street for me, because I couldn't drive anymore. I was having panic attacks once a month. I was being rushed to the hospital with panic attacks. I was in my, I would sleep on my couch, sitting up with the lights on, with the TV on, three hours sleep a night, taking pills and drinking just to get three hours sleep a night because I was so petrified to go to sleep because I had these horrible nightmares. And I would have this reoccurring dream. I would dream that I was in a glass house and it was all windows and I could see the sun actually like this. It was beautiful like this. There were the trees and the flowers and the sun was shining and I would run for the door and something so horrible was chasing me. And I had to get out and I'd go through the door and I'd still be in the house. And I'd keep running and I'd go through the door and I'd still be in the house. And that was my life. It was like I kept running and yet I couldn't get out of the house. I couldn't touch what other people could touch. I couldn't understand. My sister's been married 53 years. You know, all, all her kids are around her and her grandkids are, why can't I be like my sister? What is wrong with me? You know, it was that constant running for something to fill me up, to find out what was wrong with me. And, and so I am, I'm living in a basement apartment and I decide to go to another psychiatrist because I'm going to the hospital once a month. And, uh, I go, I go to Tucson Alcohol Council on my lunch hour, all dressed up in my banking outfit, my, my spike heels and my skirt and my suit. And, and I go there and, and, uh, and that's because the HMO said you have to go there first because I was asking for another psychiatrist and the first time ever, ever, God left a lot of breadcrumbs for me all the way. First time my HMO said, well, do you drink? And I go, well, how can we always say the same thing? A little. You know, I drink a little. Well, you have to go to Tucson Alcohol Council, take a couple tests, and then we'll get you to a psychiatrist. I said, okay, they probably had a record of all the psychiatrists I went to. So I went to Tucson uh, Alcohol Council, and I sat there, and I took the test. And I go, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm doing flying colors here, you know? I'm, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm pat oh, yeah. Oh, I don't drink in the morning, you know? I, I just never stop drinking, you know? I, <laughs> I don't start drinking in the morning. I just never stop drinking at night. So I, that's not the same thing, is it, drinking in the morning? You know, do I seem to have lowered my capacity for booze? Yeah, I did. I didn't realize my liver had stopped processing alcohol. I was drunk even if I didn't drink, and I was disoriented in those panic attacks. And so she read everything, asked a little bit about me, and she said, I just want to let you know you're in the chronic stages of alcoholism. And I went, what? No, no. And she goes, yes, and what you could do is we'll allow you to go to an outpatient treatment center. You have to go to AA meetings twice a week, and um, uh, you, you do this for six weeks, and we'll pay for it. You know, And I go, oh, I don't have time. Don't you know my life is busy <laughs> in that basement apartment with my bottle of vodka on my lap? And uh, I said, I, I, I'm too busy. And they said, well, if you, you, we'll pay for it. If you, if you don't go to what we tell you to go to, you have to pay the $2,000. I said, never mind. I'll do it myself. And so I was driving home, and I'm driving, well, driving back to the bank, and I remember chronic stages of alcoholism. I can't be. That can't be. I have a job. I mean, I have a job at a bank. I have a car. Of course, the car was being held by rope 
and there was no driver's window. There was only one windshield wiper. When I drove up to the bank, they go, she works at the bank? You know, I spent all my money on booze. Mm. And so uh, I forgot about it. I forgot about it. I don't need it. I'm fine. And so then my, uh, again, God, my, my, my God, that one that I had as a child that I knew was there, kind of interceded again. And I, I got called by the bank president. And he said, I want you to go on a sales call. It's our largest client. I want you to get a construction loan. They're building a big development down in Sierra Vista. And I want you to take this young girl who I'd never met, never saw her before, from the mortgage guy. I worked in construction lending. Uh, from the mortgage lending, and you go down to Sierra Vista. Okay, so we drive down there, talk to the client, everything went well, and we decided to have lunch. And I'm sitting there, and I'm drinking my lunch, and she's eating her. She's 23 years old. At this time, I'm 43 years old. 43 years old. My life had been a big mistake to me. And we're sitting there, and I said, uh, do you think I drink too much? She goes, well, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know you. And she said, but you know what? I have a friend. And he goes to this place called Alcoholics Anonymous. It's on Ina Road at 440. She even gave me the address. It's on Ina Road at 445. And he hasn't drank in 18 years. And I said, why? Uh, <laughs> not sure why. Anyway, she quit the bank. She quit the bank. And uh, I never saw her again. It's amazing. And I continued to drink. I continued to drink. And then I thought, you know, the heck with my HMO. I'll find my own psychiatrist. And so I went through the went through the phone book, and I pointed out at a psychiatrist, and I make an appointment, and I go to the psychiatrist right down the street. Now, mind you, this is my 31st psychiatrist. They couldn't help me. I couldn't believe it because I didn't know alcohol was my problem. I thought life was my problem. I thought my stepfather was my problem. I thought my mother was my problem. I thought my husbands were my problem. I didn't know alcohol was my problem at all. And so I go to this this. Uh, psychiatrist, and I sit down, and I tell a little bit of the story, and she goes, well, I want to let you know that I'm in recovery. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't treat anybody that's an active drinker. And she goes, so I suggest, by the sound of your story, that you go to Alcoholics Anonymous one, week, one, one day a week, come back, make an appointment, come back, and we'll discuss how you're feeling about it. That was in 1993. I said, okay. So my first one, I went with a friend. I said, you want to go on a field trip? <laughs> she goes, yeah, where are we going? I go, Alcoholics Anonymous? My, father, my stepfather was a, a, an alcoholic, and apparently my whole childhood, he was in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I never knew what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I really never... I even took a course for my job, because I was getting my undergraduate degree, for uh, alcoholism in the workplace. Still couldn't identify. Still never identified. Couldn't believe it. Anyway, so uh, she said, I want you to go. So we go to this Saturday meeting, and it's a speaker meeting, and there's an incredibly handsome man in this Armani suit, and, and uh, he's, uh, he's telling a story of how he used to live on the streets and eat out of garbage cans, and he was in prison, and, and he had all these DUIs, and we sat there giggling. You know, I'm going, oh, this guy's a loser. Wow, you know. And I go, I've never been to jail. Should have been. Should have gone to jail. Never had a DUI. Should have had a DUI. I have no clue how I've never had a DUI. I have no clue. Uh, and I thought, no, I'm not an alcoholic. So I went back to her. I said, I'm not an alcoholic. She goes, we'll go back next week. So I went back the next week. And I think I heard a little bit something, but not much. So I did this for eight months. I am an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. Drinking, drinking the whole time. 1994. Something magical happened. I had come back from my appointment with my psychiatrist, and I walked into my house, and something came over me. And I went, I'm done. I'm done. I, I have no fight left in me. I don't know what to do. I absolutely was broken, mentally, physically, and spiritually broken. There was no fight left in me. The power of positive thinking, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I had thrown away God. I, by the way, I had joined seven churches in Tucson on my quest to prove, you know. I, yeah, I went to, I went to a Methodist church because they have great music. I said, well, that'll help me, you know. That didn't help. Go to Lutheran church. I, because it's structured. No, that didn't help me. I went to a Southern Baptist church. True, true story. And, uh, I got dunked in front of 700 people in the, in the, uh, congregation. 
700 people, and they put a robe on me, and they put me in that tank, and they pulled me out, and all I saw were 1,500 eyes looking at me going, who you think you're kidding? I couldn't wash it off. I couldn't wash what I had on me. Nothing was helping. And uh, I was broken, and I laid down on the floor fully dressed, and I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it. I'm so done. I don't know what to do. And I meant it to my core. I don't know what to do. You've got to help me. I was telling Mark uh, that I've been listening to an incredible tape. It's an Elvis tape. It's a gospel tape in my car. And uh, the reframe of it is, uh, I didn't know this song when I did that, but it was very similar to what I said. It's The reframe is, uh, with humble heart, I'm bending knee. I'm begging, please help me. And that's what I was doing. Help me. And I woke up the next day, and like I always do, you know, I got dressed, I put on my suit, took a shower, put on my suit, and went to the bank, and I couldn't stop crying. I literally could not stop crying. And I sat, I canceled all my appointments, and I shut the door, and I just sobbed. And all of a sudden, the voice of a young girl came to my head. There's a meeting on Ina Road at 445, and I I have a friend who hasn't drank in 18 years. And I got up, I went into my boss's office, and I was sobbing, not just tears, I was sobbing. And I said, Fred, I think I'm an alcoholic, and I'm going to an AA meeting. He goes, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Woo, he was saying, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I, re- I, I remember that day, uh, you know, now see, I went from Cleveland, which has one of the least amount of sunshine, to Tucson, which has the most one of the most sunshine, and the sun is shining, and it's a beautiful day, and the clouds are on, and I, it, it does go up a hill, and I could see the dome of the church. It was an Episcopalian church on Ina Road, and just looking at the domes, something came over me. But on this shoulder, I was hearing, you're never going to laugh, you're never going to dance, you're never going to sing, you're never going to have sex. Not that I was singing or dancing very much. And on this shoulder was... <laughs> On this shoulder was, I just want to be different. I just want to be different. I just don't want to be me anymore. I cannot handle being me anymore. And I walked into the room, and I sat way in the back, and I folded my arms up, and I was sobbing. And again, in a split second, in a split second, something was going to happen that was going to change me forever. The Jackie that walked into the room was never going to be the same again. And it was as if that God that I had as a little girl, I could cry every time I think about it, put his hand on my shoulder and said, it's time. It's time. And I went, oh, my God, I'm an alcoholic. I, at that moment, began recovery. I conceded to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic. I believe I did steps one, two, and three the night before when I laid down and finally surrendered. You know, finally said, I cannot do it anymore. And that's what steps one, two, and three are. They're the surrender steps. You know, I got to tell you a story about uh, about step two. I was in I was in the meeting for about I, I lose track of time, so I don't even know if this timeline is right. Maybe three weeks, maybe a month. I don't know, but I would come out of the meeting. It was it was four forty five to five forty five, and I would go and get in my car, and it was about I don't know ten to six. And I turned on the radio, and that song I believe for every drop of rain that falls, and I, I love to sing. I can't do it, but I love to sing, and I would be singing in my car. The next day I go to the meeting and I get in my car and I turn on the radio and it's 6.15 and it's that song, I believe, for every day. And I start singing. I get in the car on Wednesday. It's like five after six. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I got in my car at different times. God is my witness. That song came on. And on Friday, that song came on and I was singing and I went, oh my God. And I had to pull over and I stopped. I, I just started sobbing and I go, oh my God, I believe. I believe. And it wasn't that I didn't believe, I didn't believe anybody. I didn't believe doctors. I didn't believe churches. I didn't believe my friends, but I believed you. For the first time in my life, I believed you. And some of the first things that I heard that I believed that I was astonished at was they said, you never have to live that life again. I was 44. That was in November of 1994. And when the person said, you never have to live that life again, I went, I don't. I, I don't. I was shocked. I, I, I really didn't. I, I, I believed there was no hope for me. I had gone too far. I was 44 years old. You know, I had lost everything. Mostly I had lost 
the connection with you and my creator. Not that I even had ever had a connection with you. Uh, but I had lost all hope. And I believe that learned hopelessness leads us to, to a destiny that's alcoholism beyond, beyond hope until you get it. And um, I believed you. And the other thing that was said is you never have to take another drink again if you don't want to. In fact, you don't have to take another drink again if you do want to. And I went, I don't? I don't? Wow. I didn't, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't know. And I just went right into the program. I just love the program. Now, when I, when I, when I called my sponsor, she was a professional woman. I thought, you know, I could, I, I'm going to go with a professional woman like me. And, and, um, she was, uh, I would say things like, uh, well, I'm a high bottom drunk. And she'd go, who are you kidding? You're a lush. I go, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I was delusional. I was absolutely delusional about who I was and what my life was. And even the events that happened in my life, I was delusional. I had no idea what the truth was. I had been lying to myself and others for so long, like it says in the book. We don't, we can't differentiate the truth from the, from the false. And I was at that stage. And you know, we, I thought, oh, the four step, gosh, I've gone to 31 psychiatrists. You mean I gotta write all this down again? How many times do I have my tell my story? But you see, the fourth step is not telling a psychiatrist your story because for one thing, I lied. You know, when I, how much do you drink? Oh, a little. Come on. You know, <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. I would, it was situational. You know, I'd go to a psychiatrist when I'd get divorced and I got divorced a lot. So I went to a lot of psychiatrists. You know, I'd go to a psychiatrist when something would happen to me in the b bars, you know, and, uh, it was all situational. And when I got to the fourth step, it was so magnificent for me. For me, it changed my life again. I was never going to be the same ever again. And that third column, I realized that I had been living my life in that third column. You know, with everybody with that low self-esteem and that pride and the inability to form a relationship with another human being. You know, all that, that's where I was living in my life. And something so miraculous happened to me when I was able to move over to the fourth column and my sponsor would put, the truth is... The truth is, I was so desperate, so desperate to be different that I had awakened. I had awakened to wanting to know what the truth was. And I was so thrilled about it. It was like, it was like I was, I was going to kindergarten for the first time. You know, it's like, wow, I didn't know that. I got to see my mother in a different light. I got to see the pain in my mother. I had no idea. I got to see how others, how, how my life, how I had affected other people. You know, I had no idea. My perception of life changed and I loved it. I was so excited. You know, doing the night, I remember being maybe three, four months in a, I don't even know if I had done the steps yet. Uh, don't know the timelines, but I remember being in a ninth step meeting. And I'll tell you, let me, let me back up. Five years before I got sober, I'd go back and visit my family. And, uh, my stepfather called me. He had long been divorced from my mother. He divorced my mother when I was 19. And, um, uh, he said, I'd like to have dinner with you. And I go, oh, I don't think so. And he said, uh, please just let, just come to dinner. And I go, no, I'm not going to go to dinner. I hate you. I hate you. I will not come to dinner. He said, free booze and food. I go, okay, I'll become come to come to dinner. Okay. And, and I didn't even notice when I walked in and sat at the table that he wasn't drinking. And he began to tell me the story of his life, sounded like. And I go, you know, and he just kept saying, I'm sorry. And I go, I don't care. I hate you. And I will always hate you. And he, all he would say was, I understand your pain. Is there anything I can do to make it better? And I'd say, no. There's nothing. I will hate you to the day I die. There is nothing you can do. And I don't know if we stayed there an hour or two hours, but my last words were to him were, I hate you and I will hate you to the day I die. And I'm sitting in that ninth step meeting years later, and I went, oh, my God. He was making amends to me. And this is before I even knew how to make my amends. But I was able to call him. And I didn't condone what he did. I didn't say it's okay, your behavior. What I was able to say is, I understand. Because I was him. I was him all the way. In fact, in many aspects, worse than him. And I had a connection with him that I understood at that point. And before he passed away, every time I go to Cleveland, we'd go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings together. And he would introduce me as his daughter, and I wasn't his daughter. And he would sit next to me and sob. 
And I will tell you what that did to me. You know, they say the ninth step transforms you. It transformed me because in that moment, what happened between my stepfather and I, I was able to forgive my mother in an instant. I was able to see my mother's life and how sad it was and how here I had this wonderful life, this chance to live again. And she was still in the mode of this is hell on earth. You know, she was so, so full of hate and resentment up until the day she died. She died a, a, a tra tragic life, but I will tell you, she passed away in 2010. And uh, I was able to, she had gone blind and she was in a coma, and I got to lay down next to her, and I visited her every year. And I didn't have to tell her about what she did wrong in our past. I was able to love my mother for the person that she was. And I was able to lay down next to her and truly love my mother and feel her pain and hope that in her passing she would find peace. Now, that's a transformation. That's a transformation for me because I hated my stepmother, I mean, my stepfather and my mother for many years, many years. You know, my children, uh, I was able to make amends to them, you know, and they would, oh, don't worry, Ma, don't worry, Ma, don't worry. But my daughter always threw it up to me. She's bipolar, and she was constantly saying, well, you were never around, and, well, how would I know? Nobody ever taught me this. And, you know, and I, and I, I did what I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I know I hurt you. I understand your pain. Is there anything I can do to make it better? You know, and I meant it, and she knew I meant it. She's 43 years old now. She came to visit me last week for a week. It was the first time in 15 years that we had her and I, just her and I together for eight days, and it was miraculous. And she had sent me a Mother's Day card many years ago, and uh, it said, all I want to be is you. I love you, Ma. And my son, he's 6'6", he's six, six. And uh, he has a real deep voice. And he uh, he calls me almost every other day. He says, I love you, Mama. I love you. You know, that's the transformation in the family through the steps, through working this program of the transformation that happens in our lives. Um, you know, in 1997, uh, two things. Again, I was changed forever. One, I was three and a half years sober, a uh, little, little over three years sober. I had had surgery. And uh, they gave me Vicodin. And I was, by the way, my nickname was Happy Jackie. I was Happy Jackie. I was GSR. I had sponsees. I was secretary of meetings. I loved my life. And I did. But there was still something inside me from that old school of me that I can't let you know I'm afraid. I can't let you know two of my biggest character defects that you think I'm stupid or weak. I would go to my grave rather than you think I'm stupid or weak. And I was having a lot of personal problems and medical problems. And people would say, how are you doing? I go, I'm doing fine. I, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm good. And uh, I had surgery, used the, the, the pills as directed. Well, kind of as directed, you know. It was one every four hours, so I took two every two hours. But uh, And they ran out. And, and the pressure of me saying, I'm fine, I'm okay. Again, I think my God intervened. And uh, I took two Vicodins, and I went to a meeting, and uh, they called on me, and I go, I love my life. Everything's wonderful. I love my life. And uh, all of a sudden, I started crying. And I said, i got to change my sobriety. I'm a liar. I'm not okay. And I took two Vicodins. And, and somebody said, well, you had surgery. It's okay. I go, no, I took them out of somebody else's medicine cabinet. So... <laughs> So my sobriety date is still 7-11-97, so I'll be celebrating 21 years in July. And the, uh, Thank you. And the other thing that happened to me in 1997, there was a man in, in my home group that uh, at the time had 27 years of sobriety, and uh, he was living in California. Actually, he was living in California in Maui, and he had moved just temporarily to to Tucson, he was in the middle of a divorce. We all hung around together, bunches of us, during those three, three and a half years. And uh, he went away for a couple of years because he got a, a divorce after many, many years to grieve his divorce. And, and one day he called me and he said, Jackie, Don Babb. And I go, Don Babb, Don, because he had been gone for two years. I go, oh, oh, Don. He goes, I'm coming to town. You want to have dinner? And I go, yeah, let's have dinner. Six weeks later, we were married on the beach of Maui. No. <laughs> He changed my life forever. I will tell you that that there was not another person that I knew in a long time that loved Alcoholics Anonymous and God as much as me.
and we had just clicked. Something had changed in my life because of the steps. I had been transformed. And for the first time, I'm sorry, for the first time in my life, I was able to form a true partnership with another human being. And we went to lots of meetings, lots of meetings together. And thank God for the 10th step, you know, because, you know, he had 27 years of sobriety. I was kind of new in sobriety because I had just changed my sobriety day. And we would have these little arguments, you know, and I would go, la, 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 I'm not listening to you, la, 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 la. And he'd look at me, you know, like I was 47 years old at the time. He goes, okay, <laughs> you know. Um, but I would go to my sponsor and he would go to his sponsor and we just started to gel. He worked his program, I worked my program. And it just became a beautiful thing. We went to, uh, um, gosh, five international conventions together. Uh, we traveled, we traveled, we lived part time in Maui and, and, uh, and in California. You know, we, we went, we just, we just, everything was Alcoholics Anonymous to us. And in, uh, 2015, you know, we went to the Atlanta convention and we went cross country. Some friends from Tucson followed us and, and uh, we went to Atlanta and he goes, well, I can cross that off my bucket list. He says, I've been to all 50 states now. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And then we drove to Washington DC and, and uh, he said, well, that's another bucket list. I wanted to make sure that you went to, to Washington, D.C. I had been there, and I knew, I love history. I love history. And uh, he knew I would love to go to Washington, D.C. So we went to Washington, D.C. Then we drove up to New York and went to uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I can tell you, in all my life, I've never seen a bigger Dodger fan or baseball fan than my husband. I mean, ooh. So we got to watch the All-Star game in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And he goes, wow, I've waited 35 years for this. And then we drove to Cleveland to visit my family, which I do every year. And it was my sister's 50th wedding anniversary. And, and, uh, we danced and we had a great time. And, and, uh, it was just a beautiful evening. And we were sitting there and he had the Dodgers on his phone. You know, he goes, look, the Dodgers just got a home run. They won. And I said, yeah, that's good. And all of a sudden he looked at me and said, man, I'm dizzy. Fell in my arms and had an embolism to the heart. And you know, the reason, The reason I mention that that is so prominent in my life is that in a split second, I was never going to be the same. You know, I was 66 years old. I had finally found eight year, 18 years. He had 46 years of sobriety at the time, you know. And I was so blessed to have someone who loved Alcoholics Anonymous as much as I did, who was in search of that closeness, that relationship with his higher power as I did. It was a gift from God that I had never had before. And I thought, I'm changed forever. I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to do this. And I was telling Mark, I was so afraid every day. But you know what never changed? Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous never changed. You know, the steps remain the same. The principles remained the same. You know, the meanings were the same. When I came back from Cleveland and I walked into that room, everybody lined up, stood up, and gave me a hug. And, uh, you know, I don't, I know I wouldn't have been able to do it without Alcoholics Anonymous. And they had taught me to continue, and he had taught me to continue doing what you're doing every day. You work Alcoholics Anonymous. You work with another alcoholic. You know, the 12th step, uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to other alcoholics. Yeah, I can't do it on my couch. You know, I got to do it out there. And I go to a lot of meetings and I have a lot of sponsees and it has enriched my life so much because, you know, I can look in a woman's eyes and I can say, I know how you feel. You know, if you go to a hospital and you see somebody with a broken leg and you go, I know how you feel. If you haven't had a broken leg, you don't know how they feel. But I do know what guilt and shame is. I do know what loneliness is. I do know the inability to form partnership with another human being. I know that. And, and I, and I know the way out. I love this story. Uh, there's a story. Actually, I heard it on West Wing. There's a story of a man walking down the street. You probably heard this a million times, but he's walking down the street and he falls in a hole. And, uh, he's going, help me, help me, help me. And a priest walks by and looks down, and writes a prayer and throws it in the hole and walks away. He goes, well, that's nice. I got a prayer. I can use it, but I'm still down in the hole. And uh, a doctor walks by and he goes, help me, help me, help me. The guy walks, the doctor does a prescription, throws it down the hall and walks away. He goes, well, now I, I could use this when I get out for my broken bones, but I'm still in the hall. And all of a sudden a friend walks by and jumps in the hall. And he goes, well, that's really nice. I have company, but now we're both in here. And he said, yeah, but I've been here before. I know the way out. 
And that's Alcoholics Anonymous to me. And that's the gift I've been given. I have been given the gift to say, I've been there, and I know the way out. And I do love my life. It is not problem-free at all. You know, one of my, how much more time do I have? It's got to be, right? Five more minutes. Okay, two things I want to say. The 11-step prayer is my foundation. I love the 11-step prayer. You know, I uh, I usually say the, se- the third step prayer, the seventh step prayer, and the 11th step prayer. And about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I realized that I was doing it by rote, by mem- memorization I was doing it by. And uh, I would, before I even get out of bed, I say, I mean, you know, okay, where there is hatred, let me so love with it. And uh, all of a sudden I went, wow, why don't I listen to the words? Why don't I listen to what that prayer says? Why don't I try to practice, you know, where there is hatred, let me sow love, where there is injury, pardon, where there's doubt, faith, where there's despair, hope, where there's darkness, light, where there's sadness, joy. I mean, what a powerful prayer that is to keep me in connection with you. If I can remember that, because that's what you gave me. In all the darkness, you gave me light. You know, with all my sorrow, you gave me hope. You gave me a life beyond my wildest dreams. You know, I uh, I am a changed woman. I've had many spiritual awakenings when I've been here. And working with other alcoholics and the meetings have just, you know, I just want to say, I have to say this, though. Believe me when I tell you, I have all these character defects. Mark and I were talking about it. But i got to tell you two stories. One, before I got sober... I went to San Diego all the time to get drunk with my friend from Tucson. And uh, one night, this guy asked me if I wanted to play Torrey Pines golf course. And that was my dream. I go, yeah, I want to play Torrey Pines. And he says, okay, meet me outside at 6.30 in the morning. So I got ready and hangover and everything. Went outside and 6.30 in the morning, quarter to 7, 7, 7.15, 7.30. Well, we met in a bar, for God's sakes. You know, he never showed up. But I began to tell everybody that I played Torrey Pines. And I would tell everybody, over 18 years, I would tell people, I played Torrey Pines. And then I would expand on it. You know, that fourth hole, beautiful, but it's really windy. It's a tough, tough hole, you know. And, uh, you know, I started doing the steps. And I I told my husband I played Torrey Pines. I told my sponsor I played Torrey Pines. I told my friends I played Torrey I, Everybody I met, I played, I played Torrey Pines. And uh, one day I'm playing cards with my friend on a Sunday, and there's the golf tournament on at Torrey Pines. And that same voice that talked to me, about the meeting on Ina Road said, it's time. And I said, you know, Kathy, when I told you I played Tory Pines? She goes, yeah. I go, I never played Tory Pines. And she goes, why did you tell me that? I don't know. I don't know. And the other one was, and I told my sponsor that I did this. I told my meeting I did this, you know, and they laugh. They think it's really funny, you know, ha ha. And I told my sponsor, and she goes, oh, that's pretty funny, Jackie. The second one was we went to the, uh, the San Antonio convention, and we drove up to to Dallas to meet our friends and go to a Ranger game. And we're sitting there and they're kind of talking, Jack and his wife and Don and I, but I'm watching the game. And all of a sudden I see the players on the field drop to their knees and Don and Jack are going, oh my God, oh my God. And I go, what, what, what happened? He goes, that guy just tried to catch a foul ball. And we were in the high bleachers and he went over the railing and I went, oh my gosh. They took him away, broke every bone in his body. They took him away and we're walking out and there's a news person there. And she sticks a microphone. What was I supposed to do? She stuck a microphone in my face and she goes, did you see it? I said, I saw the whole thing. It was shocking. It was shocking. It's on YouTube, by the way. It it was shocking. It was on the 10 o'clock news, the 11 o'clock news. We had a friend call from L.A. that morning. I just saw Jackie on Good Morning America. Jackie Babb (laughs) witnessed. So I told my sponsor that. And she goes, those are really funny stories. I have uh, actually some more of them. And uh, she goes, those are pretty funny, but don't you want to know why you did do that? And I go, oh, no. That means I'd have to write. And uh, she goes, well, let's find out. You know, even after all those years, and it, it was I was sober quite a while at that time, I had realized that those character defects were still there, that I didn't want to appear stupid or weak, and then I had to expand the stories for you to like me. I still was going to that fourth column. I'm not enough. It had, it had, it had shrunk a little bit, but it was still there, you know, and how honest do you want to be and how free do you want to be? Uh, you know, I could go on for probably two hours and tell you how wonderful my life is. You know, I struggle with my, my, uh, character defects today, but I, I do that prayer from that Elvis song every day, every day now, you know, with humble heart on bended knee, I'm begging, please help me. And two last things that I will say, Don and my song, was uh, it's called The Gift from Colin Ray. And there's a line in it. It says, 
Uh, you gave your love away. I'm thankful every day. Thank you for the gift. And I thank you guys for the gift. And the last thing I want to say is that what Natalie Cole said at the end of her meeting, uh, movie, it was, uh, I have been given the grace of God. I may not deserve it, but I'm not going to waste an moment of it. Either am I. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.